Paul, ready? Ready to go. Welcome to ICANX and happy National Day for those who are celebrating. I'm Paul Weiss from UCLA and also ACS Nano. And it's my pleasure and honor to serve as the moderator uh, for uh, today's talk. Uh, we're delighted uh, to have our October uh, program here uh, with today being Professor Yuan Lin. So Dr. Lin is a professor in the School of Materials and Energy at the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China, which is celebrating its 65th anniversary today. She received her PhD in condensed matter physics from USTC. After that, she was a postdoc at the University of Houston and Los Alamos National Lab, and then was a senior engineer at Intel. In 2008, she joined the faculty of the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China as a Yangtze River Scholar Distinguished Professor. Dr. Lin works in the field of electronic thin films and devices, focusing on the development of thin films such as ferroelectric oxides, vanadium oxides, and others for applications in electronic devices, especially stretchable and flexible electronics. We're delighted to have her as our speaker today. And Professor Lin, the floor is yours. Uh, please unmute and go ahead and share your screen. Okay, so I will share my screen, right? Yes, please. Okay, just a second. So can you see my screen? Yes, it's not All yet. Right. It's show. No, there you go. Okay. Yeah, first uh, I would like to thank Alice for the invitation and thank Paul for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yuan Ling. Yeah, I'm from the... University of Electronic Science and Technology of China, located in Chengdu. I think everyone know this city because it's the hometown of Panda. Okay. Um, so today I will talk something about the flexible inorganic thin film devices, and especially their, uh, our effort to try, to, uh, try their application in bioelectronics. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I will give a brief introduction. And since uh, in this platform, I think a lot of big guys have come to this platform, especially like big guys like John Rogers and uh, I think a lot of big guys come here. Uh, most of the audience may know a lot about the flexible electronics, but to make sure I have enough thing to talk in one hour, I will still go quickly. Uh, about this part, this introduction part. Mm, we all know that flexible electronics have become a very hot research field in recent years because we all think it may change our life. Yeah, flexible electronics are those kind of electronics which can achieve various deformation such as bending, stretching, and twisting. Yeah, this slide shows us some uh, typical applications of the flexible electronics. To be honest, which uh, attracted me to this field is because of this uh, this figure, the uh, top left. You know, since I'm a mother of three children, so it, I really know how how tough the life is when the baby is in is running a fever. Now the mother cannot go to sleep. It will be a sleepless night if your baby is running a fever. You have to get up frequently to check the temperature of this, pay, this baby. And if we do have this kind of stretchable, flexible electronics like this one, like a patch, uh, which can attach to the body of this, uh, this baby, then when the temperature is higher than a certain level, it will give an alarm. Then I think most mother, most of the mothers will be very, very happy. So that's why I came to this field. I hope you can have all the mothers, okay. And then, uh, you know, I, I emphasize uh, flexible and stretchable just now 
then if we're talking about flexible, most of them may think, okay, if it is bendable, it means flexible, right? For example, some, some flexible string are just bendable. It can make a curves, curve uh, curvature, then we say it's flexible. But I would like to emphasize the stretchable. Now, why do we need electronics to be stretchable and bendable? Yeah, the reason is, uh, since we, as I mentioned, if we want to uh, marry the uh, uh, some physiological signals of a human body and just like marry the temperature of the baby, then the sensors have to attach to our uh, to our human body. You know, like some very complicated surface, like this part, this part, and this part. Yeah. The attachment or the conformality is, has a very big impact to the signal. For example, like this one is the impact of the conformality on the ECG signal. We can see uh, the, for the good conformality, then it will be a much better improvement. And also this one is the impact of the adhesion of uh, a sensor, then we can see good adhesion make make the signal noise ratio much higher than a weak adhesion. Then how can make the device uh, have good conformity and adhesion to the surface of our human body? Um, if you look at the mechanical properties of an electronic device, it may be rigid, bendable, or stretchable. If the device is rigid, then it can only uh, smoothly attach to a flat plane, a flat plane. Then if it's bendable, then it can attach to this kind of surface, which we call the planar developable surface, right? But if for a complicated non-developable surface like a ball and like our knees, then we have to, I mean, the, device need to be stretchable. Only when it is stretchable, it can conformally attach to a non-developable surface. So that is the reason why we need a device not only be bendable, but also need to be stretchable. Okay. Then uh, you, 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 you may notice the title of my talk is about some inorganic materials inorganic electronic device. Now, why do we need to use the inorganic functional materials? Uh, actually, for myself, the reason is I work on inorganic materials from my PhD study. I, I don't know how to, how to work on the organic materials. I, I have no background. So that's why I, I'm going to work on the inorganic electronic devices. But uh, um, uh, there is some reason for others, not only for myself, you know. Uh, this figure shows the carrier mobility of different materials. And these pair are some organic materials, and these are silicon and calcium isolate, our traditional semiconductor, inorganic semiconductor. We can see actually currently the carrier mobility of organic semiconductor, organic materials still have, uh, I mean, big, uh, difference much lower than the traditional inorganic materials. So from this part, which means uh, for some devices, which especially those kind of high state devices, there's still a big challenge from the materials part, uh, I mean, to use this kind of organic materials. Okay. And on the other hand, we can see in current electronic devices, um, most of them are still dominated by the inorganic functional materials. For example, for the sensing, uh, UVIR sensing materials, we use the product, these kind of inorganic materials, semiconductor, silicon, gallium isonate, gallium, uh, gallium, isonate, gallium nitride, and these are some magnetoelectric materials, uh, piero electron materials, microwave dielectric and ferroelectric materials. Then, so if we want to make 
current electronic materials, uh, current electronic devices to be bendable and stretchable, to put them into the applications which need flexible electronics. The fastest and most feasible way is to make these kind of devices. I mean, the inorganic functional materials based devices to make them bendable and stretchable. Then can we really do that? Can we make inorganic thin film device stretchable and bendable? Oh, I think most of you may have know the answer, you know. Uh, you know, the, as we mentioned in some special applications, uh, the device requirement is we want the device to be stretchable. Uh, some, in some applications, maybe deformation is higher than 20%, but for inorganic materials, its intrinsic mechanical properties is rigid, which means it's intrinsic unstretchable. The stretchability is less than 1%. Okay, so can we use, uh, I mean, some, uh, can we integrate it, this kind of thin film devices onto the elastic organic substrate, which are soft and make them together and make the device stretchable and uh, bendable. This is what we actually are, uh, most of the, I mean, the researchers in this field are trying to work on this. Um, yeah, we know the answer. Most of the audience may already know the answer because Rogers and uh, the, uh, Yong Gang Huang, they have already uh, give us their proposal. Uh, yeah, this is the, uh, using this kind of method, which means first we make them choose as the thin film, the, uh, uh, make, it, uh, uh, make them uh, as the thin film. And then we use some mechanical structure design like this kind of wavy structure and uh, island bridge structure. And then we integrate it with the elastic substrate. And because this kind of mechanical structure can make the, uh, you know, first, thin film make it flexible, means thin film state may make the device bendable. And then with this kind of mechanical structure designed, we can make it stretchable. And then, when we uh, integrate it into an elastic substrate, we can handle it uh, uh, easily, all right? So in this case, we can make a stretchable electronics. And of course, there's still some challenge during the integration of the thin film device with the softer substrate. Uh, the problem is the fabrication of the thin film device in organic materials, thin film devices. Sometimes we need a high temperature, we need photolithography processing. These processings, most of them are incompatible with the elastic polymer substrate. So uh, again, Rogers and Yong Gang, they already proposed a solution which is using a transfer printing technique. That is the, five, uh, the device are fabricated on a rigid substrate already with this kind of mechanical design. Uh, structure design. And then peeling, uh, I mean, the, the functional layer, this very thin functional layer will peel off from the rigid substrate. Um, and then it transferred the function layer onto the elastic substrate as transfer and print it onto the elastic substrate. Then we can integrate it, the inorganic functional thin film layer onto an uh, elastic substrate. And on this inorganic thin film layer, we already designed some mechanical structure, make it stretchable. Then we, I mean, using this transfer printing technique, we can, Theoretically, we can make all the traditional inorganic devices stretchable, uh, bendable, stretchable. And this is some uh, examples of, uh, I think most of them are from Roger's group. Uh, uh, something like this kind of structure, the wavy structure, island bridge structure, and these are some of the uh, devices they have made stretchable and bendable.
Okay, this is a brief introduction, although I think most of the audience may already know that. Okay, then I will show you some of the this kind of flexible thinking devices, the application of these devices in the bioelectronics. Um, I, I just divided into two parts. One is the applications in biosensors. You know, um, as I mentioned, the a very promising application field of this electronic, flexible electronics are bio sensors. Because uh, for example, since the, uh, the surface of our human body, most of the part are uh, complicated, uh, non-developable surface. So when we want to make a, a monitor of our uh, physiological signal, we want the sensors to be well conformally attached onto this part. So we want the device to be stretchable. And it may attach to um, most of our body, our skin, and also on the surface of some organs. And for this device, actually we need uh, uh, theoretically, we need three parts, uh, four parts. One is the substrate, and then sensor is the biggest, uh, the most important part. And we need to give power supply. And then there are some circuits to, uh, I mean, to deal with the signal. Then the sensors attached to the surface of our human body or on the surface of the organs, then we can do the signal monitoring. And these signals may using the wireless transmission to the dynamic monitoring or the cloud storage. Um, also, if further, we may also based on this signal to do some stimulation and treatment. And this I will show you in the next part. Okay. And the sensor may be uh, divided as the physical signal biosensor, including the microphones, pulse, voice, release temperature, and the brain waves and something like that. And I think basically uh, we can divide it on the sensors of three, three types of types of signal. Uh, one is the temperature, another is uh, strain or stress, um, and another one is the, uh, I think like the ECG and the EEG, this kind of voltage part. And also, to, Another, uh, I mean, different uh, contrast to the physical signal, we may also have biochemical signal, biosensor, uh, like a blood, sweet, tear, and this kind of different fluid. And, and from the part of how we attach the sensors, uh, it may have maybe wearable biosensor. It just, uh, attach on body or integrated onto into accessories. And it may be implantable biosensor, uh, like some healthcare monitoring and treatment in vivo. So uh, definitely implantable biosensor may have a bigger challenge compared to wearable the biosensors. Then when we talk about the uh, uh, making the flexible and stretchable biosensor. Uh, uh, one big challenge is how to tell the strain and thus affect the performance of these kinds of devices. As we know, for inorganic materials, most of the, their properties are strongly related to the strain status of the thin film. For example, for the semiconductor, the band gap will uh, be uh, affected by the strain. Just like the silicon, uh, strain silicon, just to use the strain to, more, to manipulate the band gap. And especially for these kind of stretchable and flexible devices, the device may be in very big strain status or and even the dynamic strain status during it, its working, uh, when, when it's work, when it works, so in this case, how, how can we make sure the device is not affected by the deformation? Uh, 
So actually, for the census, we may, uh, I mean, we may have two different uh, types of census which have different, uh, we may, which may need a different response to the deformation. One kind of, uh, uh, one kind of devices are uh, something like the logic component or temperature sensor or, or other sensors. I mean, uh, besides the strain sensors. This kind of sensor, actually, we want it to be very stable during the deformation, which means we don't want any uh, external strain, any external deformation affect its working state. It needs working very stably when the device is stretched or twisty or bending, uh, it, it should not be affected. But on the contrary, if we are using a strain sensor, we want to detect the deformation in this part, we need to feel the strain. We want the sensor to be sensitively detect any deformation. So in this case, for the stretchable devices, for these two different types of devices, we, we need to have different strategy to uh, deal with the strain. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, in Rogers, I mean, Yonggang's, uh, Yonggang Huang, Professor Yonggang Huang's, uh, their uh, first paper uh, talking about the mechanical design, most of them are actually try to make sure the strength to be as small as possible. In this case, uh, the external deformation will not uh, affect the working state of the uh, device, but actually if we are working on strength sensor, we need to feel the deformation. So, uh, so to work on this kind of sensor, first we need to uh, understand how the deformation affect the device, how the deformation, the external uh, big deformation, how can it affect the microstructured uh, strain or stress? and then uh, change the properties of the materials and thus affect the uh, performance of the device. So we do some basic research. Uh, we have tried to understand the uh, strain states of a wavy structure and also to try to understand the uh, strain state of a bending, a big bending. Uh, how it affects the strain and the band gap of the semiconductor like gossam isolate and ITU silicon. And we see, uh, for example, in this wavy gossam isolate wavy structure, we do see it at the peak and valley in the center part. We do see the band gap can uh, are quite different. This is, of course, because their strain states are different. So we can see this kind of periodic, pure, pure, periodic change of the band gap. Um, and also for this silicon ITO uh, height structure, when it bend, and um, we can see the, uh, sorry, the, this is in Chinese, the barrier height, barrier height can uh, change uh, when the, uh, Curving radius change from the flat state to uh, the, the curvature radius goes to three centimeters. And actually the barrier height will reduce to zero, which means it will change from short gauge uh, junction to uh, ohmic contact, ohmic junction. So based on this kind of uh, experimental result, which means uh, we can actually manipulate the strain states of a uh, uh, higher structure or the semiconductor using this kind of mechanical de mechanical design. We can get uh, what kind of strain we want to we want we want to get uh, by using this kind of mechanical design and using the external uh, force. So this means the flexible electronics also provide a new platform, new strategy to study the strain effect to manipulate the performance of the electronic devices. And also, we also try to work on some uh, organic materials besides the semiconductor. Uh, 
uh, sorry, the oxide materials, for example, this kind of vanadium dioxide, which is uh, sensing materials, the oxide materials, and um, besides the semiconductor. And this one is the vanadium oxide. We also form this kind of wavy structure and studied uh, uh, its electronic performance uh, with the strain states. And um, this one, uh, similarly, the vanadium dioxide, and um, you know, uh, as I mentioned at the different strain states, the performance of the uh, device, the property of the materials and the performance of the device may be quite different. And if we give a map of the strain states of the film, um, so in this work, actually we use the Young's modulus of the substrate to manipulate the strain on the inorganic thin film. Uh, the here is the vanadium dioxide. You know, we, we can see if the Young's modulus of the substrate changed, then the, str str the stress are coupled on the inorganic materials, inorganic thin film, the vanadium oxide thin films uh, will be different. For example, we use a substrate with low Young's modulus, uh, with the same uh, structure, with the same applied strain, and then we can see actually the, the strain coupled on the vanadium dioxide will be low if we use the substrate, uh, the organic substrate with a high Young's modulus, then the strain coupled on the vanadium dioxide will be high. And this part is, well, if, we, if the strain is higher than this, this line, then the, the film will be broken. So. So we have choose three three parts, yeah. Using different, uh, P, we use the PDMS, but we just adjusted the composition, the ratio of the PDMS, uh, which is five to one, ten to one, and twenty to one, which will modulate is the Young's modulus, and also as well as the CT, the coefficient of thermal expansion, and then then we can get different the strain status coupled on the vanadium dioxide film. And for example, this one five to one, on the five to one PDMS, the strain is higher, P1, very close to the limit, the film be broken. And P2 is slightly lower and P3 uh, on a PDMS with 20 to one the composition ratio, the strain is very, very low. This one means the PDM is very soft, very soft PDMS, which cannot really drag the vanadium dioxide. And then we merged its, uh, uh, its electronic, uh, uh, the electric performance, which is the resistance change versus the temperature. Then we can see very big difference uh, um, because the vanadium dioxide is a phase change materials. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a there is a phase change at around 36, 36, um, 36 census degree. And if we actually change the strain status, the phase change uh, temperature will be modified and it will go to higher temperature. Yeah. All right, so all this just tells if we change the structure design, if we change the uh, materials, for example, the substrate or uh, all the, even the thickness of the film, then we can actually monitor the strain coupling between the substrate and the thin film. In this case, we can monitor the performance of the uh, devices. On the other hand, we can also use the change of the geometry design to tailor the strain distribution. For example, this one, we have uh, made a strain sensor using this kind of serpentine structure. And this is the, uh, uh, is a piero electric materials. Actually, we use PVDF here. Uh, although PVDF is organic material, but its stretchability is very, very low, similar to inorganic materials, all right. And then we make this kind of structure uh, to improve its stretchability. And 
we find actually if we change the geometry design of the uh, serpentile, for example, is angle and all the width and the line, the width ratio, and then we can actually change the strain distribution on this serpentile land. And then it will change its response of this kind of piero electronic device. So by optimized the geometry design, we can uh, in, increase the stretchability to 30% of this, drug, this device and also the sensibility, uh, the se sensitivity can be well optimized. For example, like this, we change the design, the sens sensitivity can increase. So based on the previous study, then we try to get a better sensor, some better, the sensors with better performance by optimized structure design, optimized uh, substrate materials, all the uh, sensing materials and the interface, then we can get sensors with better performance. And we try, we, we already work on a couple of sensors like the strain sensor, uh, temperature sensor, uh, the strain sensor can be used to mirror the pulse, the voice, uh, the micro strain sensor to uh, test, to monitor the voice. And the temperature sensor, we have used it to monitor the breath. And also we try to use the, uh, this is to mirror the e coach of the, uh, of a mouse, of a rat actually. Then this, we mirror the brain signal, this, also use this kind of structural design. And first we use some resist, resistive electrode, just, just the metal electrode here. And then to make the better signal noise ratio, then we try to use the capacitive electrode and which we embed a very tight uh, layer uh, as a dielectric layer to make a capacitor electrode. Uh, also is a, uh, stretchable design. And recently, we try, since we already tried to make uh, different types of sensors and late and recently, uh, because, you know, once we want to uh, uh, diagnose a disease, sometimes we need multiple uh, uh, physiological uh, signals to detect the multiple signals to give to the doctor and it may give a better diagnosis. Then, then we just want to know if we can uh, make a platform which can get, uh, can monitor uh, different signals uh, simultaneously. So we try to make a wearable multifunctional sensor which can, can detect the different signals. So, this one is actually making some uh, detector on a contact lens, on a contact lens, just make it like this. Uh, normally, if we want to make multifunctional sensors, we just uh, make different types of sensor and integrate them together, right? And this will make the platform complicated. We need to uh, try to, uh, to uh, how to integrate different sensors together. So this time we just want to use the one materials, just use the functional of these materials to achieve the different functional uh, uh, detector. So this time we use an inorganic materials, these materials. It is a magnetic nano materials, nano sheet. We, we just make it as the state of nano sheet. And then using this one, we can measure the biochemical signal. And also we can also detect some biophysical signal because it's a magnetic materials. We just um, using a Tesla, te uh, Tesla meter uh, on the frame glass. Yeah, this is a contact glass, contact lens, put it in the, on the eyeball. And then outside we have a frame glass as well, to, frame glasses as well to uh, put some extra device on these frame glasses. 
And then using this one, we can detect the eye movements. And also we can uh, detect the biophysical uh, intraocular pressure as well. So using the one sensor, one materials, and then we can achieve the multifunctional sensor, can simultaneously detect biochemical and biophysical signals. So I think uh, almost time almost goes to half. And uh, so I will close to this part about the biosensor. Actually, the challenges in biosensor, uh, one, one big challenge is how to calibrate the signals in different environments and how to ensure stable operation of the biosensor under harsh conditions, and how to integrate multiple of the biosensors for comprehensive monitoring of the physiological conditions. Yeah, we try uh, to work on this challenge and but still on the way. And then I will move to the next part is we try to apply these kind of thinking devices in some non-pharmacologic uh, Ecological treatments. So actually, to to get in this film is uh, because of some collaboration with Professor Xu Dong Wang. That is one of my uh, PhD students uh, work as visiting students in his group, and my my uh, PhD students, uh, Doctor Wang Yao, currently is one of my. Uh, well, is also one of the uh, research in my group now. So when he worked in Xu Dong Wang's group, he, he, they had done this work. I think it's really very interesting. It's using the uh, vagus nerve stimulation uh, to control the way of a mouse. Every time when we demoed this work uh, on some meeting conference, then a lot of ladies show very big interest. And even after my talk, uh, most of them, uh, a lot of ladies come to me and say, hi, can this device on the market, how, how can it be on the market? Uh, so I think this topic will be a big interest to uh, a lot of people. So this one is, you know, there's some device uh, there are already some device on the market using the vagus nerve stimulation to control the, uh, our uh, control uh, to, for weight control. That is, if you, you, you stimulate the vagus nerve, you will feel full and you don't want to eat. Um, but currently on the market, those devices are not flexible and it's decided on there is a switch once you, you want to control, then you just plus, uh, press on the button and then it give an electrode signal to stimulate on the vagus nerve and you just don't want to eat. Depending on your mind, that means if you have big uh, determination, oh, I don't want to eat, you just press on the button, right? But this is not healthy. And if you see some food and can't resist, the uh, temper, then you you will uh, forget to press the button. Then what uh, Professor Wang and my uh, Dr. Yao, they do is actually they put a device on the surface of the stomach. This is a piezo electro device. It can feel the um, deformation of the stomach, which means once you eat something, your stomach get bigger, then it will it will generate an electric signal. And this signal will stimulate your vagus nerve. Uh, no matter how delicious the food is, then you don't want to eat. Yeah, not depending on your determination, it depending on how full your stomach. That is, uh, I think that is really good, really good work. So this is the, what we call the smart nerve stimulation system, solely response to the persistence of stomach, not respond to your mind, okay? And the data shows 38% weight loss on rats uh, in as short as the 50 days without the rebound. 
and the strategy can be more effective for achieving the therapeutic purpose than empiric therapy. Okay, so this work is so interesting. So it dragged me in this field. So kindly we, we do something here. Um, yeah, I just show you one example. So just now the in Professor Wang's work, they use the temperature, uh, so electric field to stimulate the, uh, our, uh, the nerve, okay? So then we also do some work using the electric field to stimulate the uh, organs or the some uh, human body and, but uh, we think if we can in induce the more fields beside the electric field. So in this one, this, this work, we, we used the two, two kinds of stimulation. One is the electric field, another one is mechanical regulation. So this is a wearable device, which is, is the electromechanical synergistic dressing. So, so, you know, we all know that if we have some, I mean, there is some the report in literature that is using electric field, electric field stimulation may uh, uh, accelerate the uh, wound healing, wound healing. So that on the other hand, if we give some contraction force on the wound, it will also help the wound healing. So what we want to do is we want to combine them together. So we make this kind of dressing. On this dressing, we have some uh, uh, shape memory alloy. And this alloy, we make it uh, some design to make it like a metal materials. So using these metal materials, when we attach it to the uh, wound, to the, to the surface of a human body well there's a wound, then uh, when it attached to the human body, the temperature will activate the shape memory alloy and it will give a contraction force to this wound. On the other hand, we also put an uh, elect uh, electric film here, electric film here, which will uh, produce an electric field. And this electric field will also stimulate on our uh, cells and then it will help the wound he healing. So this is some data showing the biocompatibility. And then this is the uh, experiment data showing the difference if, is when we use this kind of uh, stimulation whether it has effect. You see, this is the uh, wound, the linear, linear type wound, wound. And then this part, we have this kind of uh, attached uh, device we made with the electric field design and mechanical regulation. Then we can see on the second day, day two, we also see, we already see this is almost uh, um, healed. Um, this one has only mechanical regulation, which means we, we only put the uh, shape of memory, the alloy based uh, uh, metal materials here, uh, no electric field. And this one only has the electric field, no mechanical regulation, and this is a controlled. And we can see the controlled, which uh, even after six days is still not healed. This is only electric field. And, yeah, it's here, it's already healed, but not as good as this one, right? This is the only have the mechanical regulation uh, also uh, showing healed after around four days. Um, okay, this is on the circular uh, wound. Similarly, we can see it with the electrical mechanical uh, double stimulation, then the, 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 the wound can reduce the very fast. And this is only mechanical regulation. This is only the electrical uh, uh, stimulation and this has non-stimulation. And this one showing the curie, uh, closure rate, closure rate is uh, 
defined as the area of the wound compared to the uh, initial area of the wound. Then we can see it for the EMSD, which means have both the electrical and mechanical stimulation. It has the obvious to, uh, faster closure rate. So, which means the electromechanical stimulation device can statistically improve the wound closure rate higher than 50%. Okay. So, okay, I think we, well, we are still doing some others, but I think those uh, has not summarized very well. Maybe next time, next talk, I will show you more. But, so let me just give you the challenge of how to do this kind of uh, stimulation. Um, the ch first challenge is first, we need to set up a self-response sensing stimulation closed loop. So the very good example is the uh, weight loss of pro Professor Xu Dong Wang. They, they, they published that one. Uh, that is really good closed loop sensing stimulation closed loop based on the uh, deformation of the stomach and generally uh, electrical signal. The signal is, is very, is, is closely related to the deformation of the stomach. And then to find out, to set up this closed loop is really important for the effective disease treatment. And another challenge is we need to understand that effect or mechanism from the various types of stimulation. For example, how the electric field stimulation uh, affect the cells, the organs, and uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, from the medical mechanism. So this needs to work closely with the doctors. And also we need to find out the effective and safe range of the stimulation signal. Uh, 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 this is also very important. Otherwise, it may have some negative effect that is we don't want, right? Uh, okay, I think I almost run out of my slides and I will give you a brief summary. So uh, in, brief, uh, in summary, through the structure design and device integration, Flexible and stretchable inorganic thinking device can be achieved. And we can use it in sensor and also we can use it to generate some signals. And so as sensor element or biomimic actuators, flexible bioelectronics can dynamically sense and monitor the physiological signals and provide timely stimulations for disease treatment. Okay, I think I I think that's all for my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Terrific. We have a, a number of questions from the audience uh, that have been coming in. Uh, the first one is from Xiaobo, uh, who says, uh, Professor Lin, could you please recommend books on flexible electronics to us? Um, I think uh, books, uh, I, I cannot find a very good currently in my, my, in my head now, but I, I recommend you to read the, uh, the publication from John Rogers group, Jernan Bao's group, and I think even these two groups almost uh, uh, give the most uh, most uh, advanced, uh, I mean, most the big advances in this field. Yeah, just mm -hmm. follow their group's research. You will know a lot. Yeah. Very good. I'll point out that their their ICANX talks are also recorded. So, <laughs> so uh, 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 Xiaobo can also watch those <laughs> and look at the references there. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk, Professor Lin. I'm a student from BIT and I have a question related to the power supply of your wearable biosensors. What strategy do you choose for power? Self-powered 
battery or wireless power supplies? Yeah, that's a real, real good question. I think that is the biggest challenge for the uh, flex, I mean, the implantable and uh, I mean, the wearable the electronics, uh, how to provide the power. Uh, for some, uh, if actually, if you want to transfer the signals out, if you want to use the wireless transfer, then you need to use the battery, no matter uh, mm -hmm. using the, uh, very flexible battery or using the wireless charging, no matter what, what kind of device. For example, for our eye contact, the contact lines that one, we put the wireless uh, 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 charge on the frame, glass, frame glasses. In this case, we can give the charge, um, give the uh, wireless charge. And for some of our other devices, we need to put uh, uh, batteries. But for the stimulation part, the uh, sensing stimulation, that um, closed loop stimulation devices, uh, because we don't transfer the signal out, then we can use the energy harvesting, the part. You know, energy harvesting, the energy is not enough for signal transfer. And so that's actually, it's a big challenge to us. We, we try to, we, we want the battery can be flexible, stretchable as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, the third question is, uh, excellent work, Professor Lin, thank you. EMSD is very impressive. Can it also be used to stimulate hair growth? Uh, <laughs> You're getting people to lose weight, the hair. Hair is next, and then I suppose there are gonna be some other. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> but here both, um, the, uh, because we don't have experimental data yet, so mm -hmm. I cannot say yes or no at current time. But, but we do do something for the bowl, uh, or because electric field will definitely help to uh, stimulate the bowl, uh, uh, healing because Professor Xu Dong Wang and my student uh, Yao Guang they already published a, a paper in the PINARS recently. Um, but definitely using mechanical regulation may help, but we haven't you know, experimental data yet. Uh. Mm -hmm. Very good. And the uh, fourth and final question is from uh, Xiao Peng. Uh, Professor Lin, uh, what are the big advantages of inorganic materials? over organic materials for flexible electronics? <laughs> so I think uh, in my talk, we talk a little bit uh, for eh, something, okay. Uh, I think inorganic materials uh, has, we use the inorganic materials because uh, its processing is mature and in current devices, more, most of them are used in organic materials. So mm -hmm. it is the fastest way and it is to, to make our devices flexible. But when you use the organic materials, there's still some challenge, right? Uh, for example, how to, uh, at least there's still some limitation for, in, for organic materials to use the, in various devices. Definitely the, for organic materials, you don't need to worry about the stretchability. You don't need to do the mechanical design, right? But the electro performance, the uh, uh, reliability, and the, uh, I mean the uh, how to how to use the in harsh conditions, all this may still some big challenge. Very nice. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, let Thank me you. retake the screen here for just a moment. Um, let's see. There we go. And so now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, Dr. Feng Yu Li is a full professor at Jinan University. Uh, he got his PhD from the Institute of Chemistry of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and was a postdoc at Bowling Green State University. He returned to the faculty of the Institute of Chemistry and then in 2018 
I was made a full professor at uh, Jinan and set up the bioinspired perception group. His research interests include photonic crystal materials, multi-analyte sensing, flexible electronics, printed assemblies, and manufacturing with 3D printing. He drafted the Chinese Printing Manufacturing Technology Roadmap. He won first prize of Beijing Science and Technology and second prize of the Chinese Academy of Sciences for science and technology development. He's also active in science communication to the public. Our second panelist is Dr. Mengdi Han. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering in the College of Future Technology at Beida, where he also received his PhD. He was a visiting scholar in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and then a postdoctoral fellow at the Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics at Northwestern University, which we heard from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, his research group aims to develop and to build 3D bioelectronics with conformal interfaces with soft biological tissues to enable new modalities in diagnosis and therapy. And our X challenger for today is Kai Chen Xu, uh, who is currently a ZJU 100 professor in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Zhejiang University. He's a key member of the state key laboratory of fluid power and mechatronic systems and senior member of the Chinese Mechanical Engineering Society. He received his PhD from the National University of Singapore and was a JSPS postdoctoral fellow at Osaka Prefecture University. His research includes multifunctional, flexible electrodes and sensors, systems integration, and advanced laser manufacturing. He uh, serves as a corresponding expert for engineering, a journal launched by the Chinese Academy of Engineering and is on the editorial board of optoelectronic engineering. So let's have everyone uh, join us here. And we will start with our X challenger, Dr. Xu. Okay, okay. Professor Paul, okay, uh, thanks for the kind of introduction. So this is uh, Kai Chen Xu uh, from Georgia University. And this, it is my great honor to meet you online on this special day, our uh, China, China's uh, National Day. So just now we enjoyed a nice talk shared by Professor Lin, who described a uh, beautiful uh, picture on flexible bioelectronics using uh, inorganic stem field. So Hunter, I have a few questions. Uh, in your official work, you mentioned a, a little bit about uh, flexible devices working at harsh environments. So we know most of the flexible electronics can work under normal temperature because the uh, elastic uh, materials can usually work at a temperature of less than 300 degrees. So if we want to design a flexible and uh, stretchable devices, working at the, that the extremely high temperature, for example, how they are 500 degrees, so do you have any suggestions on that the material selection? Because we are experts on material size. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, that's a really, really good question. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, currently I don't have the answer because uh, I don't know what kind of polymer can really stand the harsh uh, condition, especially the ex especially high temperature and extreme high temperature and extreme low temperature. Both ends will affect the organic substrate. But so my my uh, if I, I have to deal with this problem, what I can do is I will work on some. Uh, kind of uh, organic materials, uh, sorry, using some of the met metallic materials as the substrate. We use the metallic materials as a substrate and do kind of the structure design, like the uh, serpentine structure, uh, lattice structure, and this then we can achieve the stretchability and it can stand the high temperature, low temperature as well. So this is the one option which I can think. Another one is we want the organic materials, uh, the research on organic materials, if they can work on the, some new materials which, which can stand the high, extremely high temperature, extremely low temperature. And uh, the third option, I think I also, um, but I'm not expert in this field, but I also know 
you can do something like some the thermal metal materials, which can, uh, um, for example, to uh, how to say that, uh, thermal metal materials, which can uh, reduce the temperature, the extreme high temperature using this kind of thermal metal materials, which can reduce the kind of uh, do the thermal uh, uh, insulator, uh, which can reduce the very, very high temperature effect on the device. But if you want to detect the temperature, this doesn't work, right? And this is just like we do some protection layer to protect our device. So this is the, my answer at this point. <laughs> okay. Thanks, uh, Prof. Professor Lin. Uh. Okay, thanks a lot for the answer. So the, the second question is uh, about to uh, seek the advice on research career or research plans, as especially for our young researchers. You know, I, I achieved my PhD degree in 2018. And after two years of uh, postdoc worker in uh, Japan, I joined the Department of Mechanical Engineer, Engineering in Georgia University at the end of last year. So, you know, it is very important to decide a specific research field or direction at the early stage of a uh, research career. So may I uh, seek some advice from you on how to choose uh, a specific research field? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah, good, good question. So, and uh, actually when I at your age, I also get very confused. <laughs> so, <laughs> but luckily I get into this field, uh, stretchable electronics that make me feel really good. You know, uh, before, uh, uh, when I at your age, I work on the uh, oxide thin films, oxide thin films. What I do is I try to grow high quality films and I can grow the very good films with good properties, good interface control, and very few defects. But I don't know what can it be used. I where it can be used. I just grow the film and publish some paper. Then that's it. I just stop at the publication. And later, for uh, for a very uh, I, I just by chance, I get a note. Um, with Professor Feng Xue, Professor Xu Feng, and uh, and he asked me to join his. Uh, I collaborate with him to work on this kind of inorganic, uh, thin film device because I can grow high quality films. And then if we can make this film stretchable, then we can do this kind of stretchable electronics. Then he is the. I think his background originally is on. Um, uh, Mechanic, uh, mechanical engineering, I think something like that. And I'm on the material science on the same film devices. And then we collaborated and we we make some uh, in, uh, oxide thin film devices, which can be stretchable, flexible. And later, uh, when we make these kind of devices and some doctors in the hospital show big interest. And they said, if we can collaborate and try to make the devices, uh, into the real applications, uh, go to go into the hospital, uh, try to use it in some of the patients and to see if it works or not. And then I found it's really interesting because our research are not stop at publication, right? We can go to real application. We can try to make it a real product and maybe later goes to real products. And at least we can help the doctors, right? That will be very interesting. So uh, I think you, you have a very big, very good background because you have mechanical engineering background. You have the uh, later work on the materials and the electrical devices. Then this background will help you a lot because you can find some fields which are different from the people only have one background. And you can see a lot of chances. And I, I believe you will find a very interesting field. Uh, my opinion is not just stop at the publication. Need to go to real the devices, go to applications, and then you will find more, it's, it's more interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Let's move across our panel now to uh, Professor Han.
Yeah, sure. Hi, Professor Lin. So my, my first question is actually related to your answer. You mentioned that uh, publication is not uh, the final stop. You have yeah. to find application and probably make it into a product. And as Paul introduced at the very, big, at the very beginning, you have working experience in very good company and also top universities. So how long do you think those inorganic film uh, flexible devices can go to the market and what do you think is the key difference of industry and research? Okay, okay, uh, that's a good question. So how long it can go to a real product and um, depending on the efforts of all of us, you know, currently I think that the one big challenge is the uh, processability, uh, the processability. I mean, the processing, if it's really manufacturable, then we are trying to work on this. I mean, theoretically, this device has no big uh, problem, at least for the sensor parts. I think maybe for CPU or this very complicated device is still a big challenge, but for sensor parts, it's not so theoretically, it's, it's, it can be product, it's not very hard, but just make, make sure the processing is manufacturable then. So we are also working on with some company uh, to try to make it uh, processable. Yeah, this is the, mm, and I think at least it, it's, it's easier to make the organic, <laughs> Uh, uh, products to 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 the uh, I mean to use the all the organic materials in the sensor maybe the inorganic uh, device maybe faster mm. and another uh, the second question is, is what I'm sorry yeah is what 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 are the differences of industry and research based on your experience okay 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 uh in industry uh the 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 one one big difference is industry is profit dri driven, profit driving, which means that no matter what you do, the company need to evaluate it and need to gain the profit. If it's not, even it's very interesting, but if it has no big market, then you have to stop it. Uh, so at the very initial part, if your, your research is very initial, then in industry maybe has very little chance, but in university it's different. It's not profit driven. Yeah, you can do the anything to maybe after five, 15 years, it can go to market, but you can study here. You can study it in, in university. So in university, you have more freedom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I see. See, so I have another question. So because I'm also doing some uh, work on inorganic flexible devices. So the biggest issue that I encountered during my research are the sensi uh, sensitivity, uh, not the sensitivity. I mean, how to decouple the uh, influence of different uh, external stimuli. For, for example, usually, for example, metal, the resistance of metal are sensitive to both temperature and uh, pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how to yeah, decouple yeah. them from the design of the structures. And also another thing I, uh, another issue that I got is on the robustness of those inorganic materials. Although we have some structural design like the serpentine interconnection or placing it in the mechanical neutral plane, but will that be sufficient to be finally used in the industry or as a product? So what's your opinion on this? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, how to decouple the signals? It needs to, depending on the application case. For, for example, we also work on one uh, device to can, can measure the pulse and temperature simultaneously, but just using one materials. Then we need to, because the pulse and temperature, the changing frequency are different. Then we just do a FTT to make different signals uh, respond to different frequency. Sometimes you need, uh, uh, I mean, to work on the mechanism of this the sensing. Depending, uh, some uh, in most in most uh, cases, you know, different signals affect the response simultaneous, just as you said. So what we do is we do we need to study the mechanisms of their, their response, their, uh, their change with the signals uh, theoretically, and then try to find some uh, 
some parts. For example, the signal, uh, most of them are uh, trying to do some uh, signal treatment after you're getting the signal. Yeah, this is the uh, one question. Uh, another one is uh, about the, I'm sorry, uh, robust, right? Robust, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it, that's a good question. And I think uh, besides the structural design, uh, what we can do is um, structure design is the most, uh, most uh, good way, I think. So you need to do the mechanical analysis before you design the devices and uh, make sure it's in the safe to strain state. And on the other hand, we need to do the packaging, the packaging on the, on the, on the device. This will help to protect the device. You know, simil uh, similarly, even in microelectronics, you have the same the challenge. You know, the microelectronics, silicon based microelectronics, they also face the same challenge, right? They are also the very thin the inorganic thin film, whether it will be broken or not. We also need to do a lot of uh, theoretical analysis to, and then also do some the packaging to make sure the strength is not very high. No, in Intel, we also often have die broken, this kind of problem. You don't think that. In organic materials, it looks like really brittle, then it's so easy to be broken, right? Similarly, we have right. used a silicon dye for such a long time that we can handle it easily. So in the stretch of electronics, it is the same. We can handle it if you do the design, a good design at the beginning, no problem. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer and your insights. Thank you, thank Very you. Good. Let's move across the table now to Professor Li. Okay, okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks to Professor Li. Very nice, very nice talk and a very nice reply. Uh, I have uh, I have two small questions. Uh, number one is I it's uh, your uh, presentation gave me really uh, deep imaging on your uh, wonder healing uh, with the uh, uh, contracting force. So I have question during my research uh, when I when I uh, when, when I touch the devices on the screen of the human uh, screen, uh, you, they usually get the sweating. Uh, so during the sweating, the, when the uh, electrodes uh, get a weighting, so they always lose the uh, adhe adhesion. So how uh, uh, do you do you have any suggestion for the uh, how to swallow boat? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, sweating. Yeah, then kind of you have some water right at the interface, then it will affect the attachment. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Feng Xue, Xue, Xue Feng's group, they have uh, do some work on this the attached uh, substrate. You need to use some attached substrate, which is kind of can uh, make it uh, um, uh, better absorb. Uh, the water and something like this is the uh, in 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 our design uh, under the metal uh, the, the the mechanical looking the shape memory uh, alloy layer after that we beneath that layer we have a, a how to say that dressing layer the dressing layer is the one they used in the hospital then that one. Uh, is kind of absorb the water. It's kind of kind of can have the uh, good air. Uh, how to say that? That one. I mean, that one is the hospital already have this kind of dressing, but we just embedded our mechanical design layer and the electric uh, layer onto that dressing. So. That's how, Thanks, how we do that. Uh, Thanks for your suggestion. Okay. I, will, I will check the detail. Uh, mm. the, uh, the, the second question about the data processing. Uh, you know, when we touch on the screen, screens are uh, very complex systems. So the, the electronics always get the very complex uh, data. So for example, the puzzle, sometimes, sometimes the puzzle signal is come from the, uh, the muscle, the, uh, the muscle uh, electronics. So, yeah. And how to how to separate the, the signal? How to separate the data? 
Yeah, yeah, that's also the similar to the one Meng Di uh, <laughs> give. Yeah, how to separate the data. You know, uh, you, you have to analyze the, in each special the scenario. Yeah, you know, you need first to find out where the noises come come from, right? Mm -hmm. it, my, my understanding correct? If, if he's correct, talking correct, about correct, the noisy, correct, correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, my, my point is the uh, first, uh, I mean, the, my, Option is first you need based on first analyze the noisy source and theoretically get set up the mechanism and then the, uh, using some model to separate it. And another one is first you get some background background. And uh, I mean that for for example, uh, uh, you collect data for a long time. Then if the abnormal data, I mean the the one that you want to get. The abnormal data just come out at a certain occasions. Then you just remove the uh, the, the 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 noisy background first, and then to get the signal which you really want. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what do you, right. uh, what, do you uh, what do you think about the, about the uh, the machine learning machine learning processing uh, for uh, to process the data for because sometimes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's good part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, machine learning is also learning. very, very important. Yeah, yeah. That's good part. Yeah, machine but, learning is a really good, good option but, to do this. But currently, you still have gap to, to, to match the, the data processing and with the signal or database. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Need uh, more on this kind of machine learning. The yeah, the, the computer science. To work on this part. Yeah, correct, yeah. correct. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Also, thank you. Thank you for this kind of reminder. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, I, I also had a couple of questions, if you're willing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the first is uh, I was wondering what you felt you learned from your time at Intel and, you know, in working in industry in general and then uh, moving to academics. You mentioned a couple of times that you know there you no longer have to be driven by the profit of the company, but uh, the you know the uh, scientists and engineers work quite differently than the graduate students yeah. and postdocs and undergraduates in our laboratories. And so I thought it would be interesting for our audience, especially, uh, to hear uh, you know what you picked up from that, and and maybe there's something you miss uh, from industry uh, when you're you know, when you're running an academic lab as you are. Ah, okay, so you're talking about why I moved from the industry back to- Not so much why, but were there <laughs> lessons there? You know, most academics don't spend time at a company. And so uh -huh. uh, you know, your insight is, you know, is, is different than the experience that, that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. many of us have. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think many people are very interesting in my experience because when I work in Los Angeles, they think Los Angeles is a good place to work. Yeah, it has high salary, very stable work. And then I moved to industry, yeah. Uh, the reason is I just want to know how, how it works in such a very famous, company, yeah, because Intel is kind of, yeah, leading ahead, yeah, that's a really good company. Um, and then I go to industry and see it's quite different life, just as you said, it's quite different with academic. And, but in there, I learned a lot. Uh, one is how to collaborate with people from the different background, how to work on a project, yeah, uh, because you know, one product when it um, one once we work on a new product, people from different backgrounds need to work together, and there's some brainstorm. Then you will hear appearance from different backgrounds. Then you will see, oh, they think the same the same problem. Different have looked at from different aspect, and then new ideas will generate. Then that tells me you need to talk to people with different background, not only talk to people with the same background with you, then you guys may look things the same, but if you talk with people from different background, they will give you some surprise. They will generate to create some new ideas. So, and also in industry, I learned, all right, 
just as I mentioned, we cannot just stop at publication. We need to find to make, make applications. Uh, only when you go to industry, then you know though, how industry to think of their product, how they, um, uh, how they design their product from the beginning. They will think from the aspect of, of customer, but not like us when we work in university, we just think of how interesting it is. We don't think of how customer may think, right? Then that's a different, uh, different uh, view, so I think. And then after I stay in industry for uh, about three years, then I moved back to China and I moved back to university. And people, again, people feel surprised because they think, all right, in Inc., you have high salary. <laughs> then why you come back to university? You know, in university, the salary is a big job, you know, <laughs> at that time, the salary is a big job. And, but I think, as I mentioned in Intel, and in, even in the company like Intel, very, very advanced, a very, very good company. Yeah. Even in such a company, they are still profit driven, right? They are still working on very limited field. And they just, uh, uh, if you have some new ideas, then at least you're not so freedom in generating new ideas. You, if you have some new ideas, maybe it's not related to a product, it's not have big market at recently, and you cannot work on that. And so one of my friends said, I know you guys will do that because you are not, you don't, you don't like this kind of routine life. No, that's kind of routine life you work. Every day you go to the company at eight o'clock, then talk with different people to solve some problems, then that's very routine. So in university it's different because you can, every day you meet, you meet some young guys, young students, they give some surprise, they give some new ideas, then it's kind of very exciting. So that's why I moved back to the university again. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree very much with that sentiment. <laughs> uh, my, my other question is, uh, you changed fields, really, moving from yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. focused oxide uh, materials, uh, mm -hmm. you know, science and engineering, yeah. uh, into this, uh, this flexible, the beautiful work that we saw in your, mm -hmm. in your talk. And can mm -hmm. you comment about uh, how you did that? And, okay. and okay. If, if you had, you know, if you in the future decide to, you know, move over into some other field? Is there, you know, what, what <laughs> lessons had you learned from those, from, from that transition uh, that you would carry forward? Okay, okay, uh, good question. Yeah, so actually when I, uh, you know, uh, when I uh, go to the university, you know, I love physics really, because the, uh, even in my middle school, when I was in middle school, uh, my physics teacher told me, you are good, you are uh, good at physics, because one of my exam, I got a very high score, then mm -hmm. she told me, you should be good at physics, then mm -hmm. I believe it, <laughs> I think I should be a physicist. So when I go to the university, I just choose the physics as my major. Mm -hmm. And then later, um, because I think if working on theoretic physics will be too hard for me, too tough for me. So I go to experiment and then uh, work on the condensed matter physics. And later, I think in condensed matter physics, most of, most of us work on the materials. Uh, actually, we grow the materials and study the uh, physics properties of these materials and try to uh, manipulate these materials. And then, so that really almost moved to material science. And uh, later, um, I go to Intel. When I moved to Intel, that's how I really, uh, I mean, the uh, get into the field of electronic devices because in Intel, we have to work on devices. And, mm. but I really uh, like the, uh, I mean, uh, Intel, this company, I really like it because it has, it's not only the people from the double E, you know, it has people from different backgrounds, mechanical mm. engineering and uh, material science, chemistry and different backgrounds. 
multidiscipline, really multidiscipline. Mm -hmm. And then there I found, all right, even material science can work on the electronic devices, you know, even the, in electronic devices, they need a lot of knowledge from the material science. And because as I mentioned, if we only work on the um, in film growth, then I just don't know how it can work. You know, thin film growth, thin film devices, if it goes to real real application, it's really too long a wait for oxide thin film devices. Uh, I feel it's really too long a wait. And then after my collaboration with Professor Xue Feng, and then I found this very interesting, very exciting field is dredgeable electronic devices. And I think this, I just make me more, I mean, just make me more confident to go to the electronic devices, electro engineering this part. But uh, to be honest, I'm not really a professor in electronic engineering because I have very few knowledge. Uh, if just talking about the special, specific knowledge of electronic engineering, I have very few knowledge. My knowledge is still based on physics and material science, but just kind of, uh, uh, how to say that? Just kind of um, uh, make my knowledge up, uh, uh, application in this field. I think, uh, just as I said, different background may generate new ideas. So I also learn a lot from the uh, professors or collaborators from the different background. This happens to make the uh, research better, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a, that's a uh, wonderful way to, to uh, uh, finish up our, our panel. So let me uh, thank, our, thank our panelists. And if we were able to be in person, which I hope will be coming very soon, I have a long delayed trip to Chengdu and we'll hope to see you when that is okay. ultimately rescheduled. Yeah. We would walk across the stage and give you a plaque uh, thanking okay. you for this uh, terrific uh, presentation of, of your work and thoughts and, uh, and you know, on behalf of uh, Professor Alice Shang, who organizes these, and my uh, and our other uh, uh, committee members, we want to thank you for this uh, lecture and your wisdom, and our uh, panelists uh, as well today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Chengdu. Yeah. Ah, yes. Don't forget to contact with me when you guys oh, of come course. to Chengdu. No, I certainly will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank and, you. <laughs> great. And we have coming up our uh, 2021 Rising Stars of Light finalists. Uh, and that's what we have for today. So uh, for uh, those of you uh, celebrating, happy National Day. And we'll look forward to seeing you later this month at ICANX. Thank you all. OK, thank you.